painting a picture that they believed, that they hoped, and that, that they came to uh, expect and depend on, in a way. Um, the Germans were going to do a certain thing, and when the Germans didn't do this certain thing, they did their own thing, the British could not respond to it. All six swordfish had been destroyed in an attempt to rescue a failed plan. It was a humiliating episode that will always be remembered for the needless sacrifice of 13 brave men. I again, as mother, I can always remember, Johnson's mother said to me, of course, I know he's alive, he's such a good swimmer. What can you say? You can't say he's full of holes lying at the bottom of the sea. Gentlemen, at 0800 hours this morning, Goldmark forces invaded Greenland in a combined air and land offensive. As a result of this, we are now at war. Successful military plans can only be created by officers who understand the real chaos of the battlefield. The military has learned from past mistakes that planners sitting hundreds or thousands of miles away can be divorced from reality. Three CAC continue in their hasty defence, meanwhile four CAC is moving in a position to attack the war. The days of the career planner, pioneered by von Schlieffen, are over. Today's officers rotate every two years between staff and command posts in the field. To become familiar with what the military call the fog of war. Things always work out differently than you think. That doesn't mean you can't plan reasonably for their occurrence. Indeed, you must plan reasonably. The mistake is psychological. The mistake is psychological to think that because you've planned it well, reality will cooperate and it will go well. But the second psychological reason is even more important, and that is this. If you train officers to follow plans and the reality changes so that the plans don't work, do they have the capacity to innovate, to imagine, and be flexible in solving the problem? The wheel has come full circle. It's now accepted that it's the commander on the battlefield who makes the difference. A lesson learned by America 20 years ago. In November 1979, after Ayatollah Khomeini had overthrown the Shah, the American embassy in Tehran was captured by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Fifty-two Americans were held hostage in the embassy. The U.S. government was completely taken by surprise. The impulse to act was overwhelming. The Air Force wanted to bomb them back to the Stone Age. The Army wanted to land the 18th Airborne Corps. The Marines wanted to assault all the oil rigs in the Persian Gulf. And the Navy wanted to bombard them with the long-range aircraft and whatever else was necessary. National honor was at stake. While diplomatic avenues were pursued, President Jimmy Carter was already exploring other options. When the president was first brief on our capability, we told him we could not do it. The risk of the hostages was too great. After all, the basic mission is to bring them home, not get them killed. Nevertheless, Carter insisted that the United States must be able to rescue her citizens. So secretly, the Joint Chiefs of Staff began putting together a task force to do just that. Delta, the top secret special forces unit responsible for hostage rescue, had only just been formed. They'd not been tested in the field before. The commander on the ground would be Delta's founder, 50-year-old Charging Charlie Beckwith. The CIA could not assist them with intelligence. Their head of station in Iran was one of the hostages. Delta Force knew the embassy compound contained 14 buildings, but had no blueprints. All they had was the television news. What is physically happening around the embassy? Who are the hostage takers? What are they armed with? There were sentries outside the wall who were armed and could either engage us on, with fire or uh, sound an alarm. 
So we practiced shooting those sentries continuously. Highly skilled pilots would be required to get Delta Force into Iran undetected. The Air Force were already planning their route in. To get Delta out of Tehran, helicopters would be needed. Unbelievably, America didn't have a helicopter squadron that could fly undercover missions. So the search began for suitable pilots. But a conversation with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs set alarm bells ringing for Logan Fitch. I felt that he knew that if this mission succeeded, there'd be enough glory to go around for everyone, and he wanted to make absolutely certain that all of the four services got their share of the glory uh, without regard to who was most appropriate. The most skilled helicopter pilots the U.S. possessed were Air Force, men who'd flown search and rescue missions in Vietnam. But the Pentagon planners rejected them. The Army had a role uh, the primary role in rescuing the hostages, the Navy would provide air cover and would provide the ship from which they, they, they launched, the helicopters would launch. Uh, the Air Force was clearly in a key role. This left the Marine Corps out. So the Marine Corps sends a Marine Corps colonel to try to push their nose in the door and pushed his nose in the door they did. Marine pilots would fly the helicopters even though they hadn't been trained for such a mission. Once you decide to use Marine Corps helicopter pilots, who cannot refuel in flight, it becomes necessary to stop somewhere in the desert. Well, the next question becomes, where shall we stop? And what the planning process decided to do is to stop at a site which later became Desert One. Desert One, a remote location in Iran, had been earmarked by the CIA years earlier when they thought they might have to extract the Shah. It had the advantage of a main road running through it, but that was far from ideal for this operation. It was very clear that even if they got to Desert One undetected, the possibility of being discovered on the ground by the normal traffic flow that went through this road was very, very great indeed. And so more and more complex it becomes. In the words of Winston Churchill, the terrible ifs accumulate. We rehearsed assaulting buildings. We rehearsed moving from the Chancery building through a breach in the wall to the soccer field. And we rehearsed every single minute detail that we could possibly think of. We did that continuously. The surgical operation requires very precise knowledge of building plans and how entrance and exit can be made from those buildings. Door construction the locks on the doors, even the way the doors open, the way the corridors ran. We were sort of going in blind. We did not know where the hostages were. We had a pretty good idea, but we didn't know. And I think that was the greatest weakness in our plan. The planning of Operation Eagle Corps was dominated by secrecy. No one outside the task force had an inkling of the daring mission being planned. This was an oversight. The normal process of military operations is to examine the plan with what we call murder boards. Then you've got problems with their rear core area. So this is a good plan, but it's incomplete. Now what a murder board is, is a group of experienced officers who are outside the planning process, who are brought in at various points and then of course at the end in order to analyze the various elements of the plan to make sure that they are operationally, tactically and strategically sound. People get too close to these things. They get too close to their own concepts, their, 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 their own pictures that they have in their heads. Operation Eagle Claw was staggeringly complex. On night one, the Delta team would fly in from an island off Oman in C-130 aircraft. Helicopters would fly in from an aircraft carrier in the Gulf. They would meet at Desert One, where the helicopters would refuel from the C-130s. The helicopters would fly the Delta team to a hiding place in the hills outside Tehran. On night two, Delta would be driven into Tehran in a convoy of trucks. They would assault the embassy, free the hostages, 
and escape to a soccer stadium. There, the helicopters would pick them up and fly them out. Frankly, if it was going to succeed, that was going to be a will of God. And if it was going to fail and it was going to end in, in uh, uh, a gunfight and a lot of people dying, then I went in to die with my friends. The five-month hostage crisis was embarrassing the presidency. It was damaging his chances of re-election. President Carter decided to give the rescue mission the go-ahead. That same week, General Vaught had an ominous conversation with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. General Jones came to my office on Sunday morning and said, 